Good morning. Good morning. Uh, that, that, that helps me a lot. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Uh, hey. Your battery back on. You know how it goes. This morning we're going to be, um, you know, out there. of the NLT, the New Living Translation. Have you ever walked into a situation and said, what in the world is going on here? If I was wearing that wig this morning, that's exactly what you guys would be saying. But I shaved my head and um, Margaret thought it would be a good idea to bring a wig in and pick on me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, when there's utter chaos and you absolutely have no idea what's going on and there's no semblance of order at all. You know, you walk into a room and everything that you're, everybody's doing everything that they want to do and doing whatever and it's, you feel like you're in the midst of chaos. And, and to say it that it's in the midst of chaos just doesn't do it justice. <coughs> I felt like that the first time I stepped out of a cabin in Times Square in New York City. You look around and there's like hundreds of thousands of people walking and you're wondering, how do these people all live together and not kill, kill, kill one another? It's just utter chaos when you look at it. And the first time you're just like, what in the world? It's just like a brand new world that you just stepped into, especially when you lived in the country for all of your life. But I quickly realized that there was order, although it seemed chaotic, there was a purpose to what people were doing and how they were doing. The obvious is not always visible at times, and sometimes it takes work to see that. This takes observation and it takes time to see. It took a little while when you're in the midst of that chaos in New York City to look at and see that people actually had a purpose of what they were doing, although people were everywhere. People had a mission of what they were doing, and in that you have to have a mission because New York is a huge place with millions of people. But that same thing happens in church. If you walked into church on a Sunday morning and there was just utter chaos, people doing whatever they wanted to do, there was no semblance of order to it, would you want to come back? With God, order is a must, and the proper function leads to order, a godly order. God is a God of order, and Scripture is our God. This leads us to an understanding of what we do and how we do it. This leads us to knowing why order matters, and when order is not followed, it does harm to others and to others' understanding of God and the God we serve and why we serve Him. And we're in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 1 says, Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special ability the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. There's a, some churches... Tongues are a big deal. I spoke on this here many a times, and sometimes the gifts of the Spirit are confusing. And if something's confusing, then you have to have a, a semblance of order <coughs> when you use the special gifts of Spirit God gives us to use in His service. So love should be our primary goal, and the biggest portion of 1 Corinthians is about love. And you have to have a proper understanding of exactly what love is. But it also says that we should also desire the ability that the Spirit gives us. So the Holy Spirit gives us gifts as He chooses. It's not us, up to us what gifts we have. So we have to decide the term love. What does love mean? So we turn to Mr. Webster to see what we decide love is. Because 
that was written by man from man's perspective. And it's interesting to see that the definition is an intense feeling of affection, a great intense and or pleasure in something. So we have to determine what is the love of God mean. The short answer is agape, which is the Greek word for love. This is a love without a human understanding. So our finite human minds cannot understand the love that God has for us. Love is the word of God, is the word of God, and that has been revealed to us through scripture that gives a path for salvation through Jesus Christ. Love is sending your son to die for those who rejected you. So imagine for a moment that people don't like you. They talk about you, make fun of you. And in spite of that, you still desire their well-being. So much that you sent your own child to die for them in their place. So that they can be saved from themselves. I'm not sure about you, but that's not something I, as a human being, <laughs> would necessarily be willing to give my own child for others that, of course, I didn't treat many of. <laughs> so, to me, in my own finite mind, you know, being human, you would be there's another way that you probably can handle that, right? Um, but to God, that's the only way that he can accomplish that mission, to save ourselves from ourselves. If this is to be accomplished, we must have order in which things are done, and this order, and in this order, there a must that we must have, and that is love. That is a love that we don't understand, a love that we accept, a love that only the cross can give us a, a semblance of understanding. Love is a desire to be with or do something that gives pleasure to a person. Have you ever heard somebody sit there and say, well, well they're doing that for their own pleasure, so they can't be out of love? They can't be further from the truth. God sent his son to die on a cross, although that was horrific, he couldn't bear to watch it and turn his back on it. That's why when Jesus hung on the cross, he said, you know, why have you forsaken me? Because the entire time he was on earth, the father never took his eyes off the son until the point he was on the cross and could no longer bear to witness what they were doing to him. That's why when Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Because God the father literally had to turn his back on what was going on. But the fact that what was happening saved us from ourselves and now we have an, an ability to accept a relationship with Christ. That gave God the Father pleasure in doing so. Knowing that his son would receive that. And this can be an event or a person that gives us pleasure and love. We all love to do things. And we all love other people. For a person, this is a desire for their well-being while placing them above yourself and wanting what is best for them. The entire purpose of love is to give the person pleasure by giving to another. So the purpose of Christ dying on the cross gave the Father pleasure because him dying out of love for us gave the Father us. So when we hear people saying that a person is just in it for themselves, this may in fact be true, but it's also a lack of understanding of what love is. So when we do not have a correct understanding or a lack of understanding of love, we have a blurred view of what we're exposed to be doing as it pertains to love and order. So if we're going to love somebody, we have to have a semblance of order in order to do so. Everything we do has to have a semblance of order, or it's chaotic. And how can you love some chaos? 
So what is order and why is the God of why is God a God of order? Is a question we have to ask. So I'm glad that you asked that question. So order is a noun. The arrangement or disposition of people or things in relation to each other according to a particular sequence, pattern, or method. So isn't it very interesting that when we look at definitions, they actually resemble a Christian perspective. That's probably because everything that we see, everything that was created, come from God himself. So although mankind and his nature rejected God, we still have that longing and we still have that resemblance to God. It's also an authoritative command, direction, or instruction. You know, kind of like scripture. And yes, scripture is completely ordered. Not only are there a certain sequence to scripture, it's not necessarily a timeline sequence, but there is a sequence to what we are reading and the reason why we're reading it. Um, Revelations is the last book that's about the end, and Genesis is about the creation of Earth. So there is a specific order to why these books are put in the Bible for a specific reason, a specific sequence. Just like everything we do, just like church, there's a reason why we should define things. That way we know what to be expecting when discussing things like love, order. You cannot truly be loving unless we have some sense of order. We can't truly understand what we're discussing until we actually define things. So we have to take a look at, at what kinds of things we should take heed to and have order to. The entire chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians takes a look at <clears throat> such things. So we need to unpack it if God wants order, we should adhere to the order, to order. Amen? Verse 2 starts out with if. So that leaves open a few questions about, well, if it starts out with if, then that should clue us into how it is worded. Now, when this is translated from the Greek to the New Living Translation, there are reasons why because it's, you cannot directly translate Greek to English so we have to add certain things in the book and in, in our language in order to get the meaning of the Greek and I don't recommend studying Greek unless you have a lot of paper <laughs> so this seems an important a very important word when it starts out with because it leaves out that if you do this, then that happens. If you do that, then that happens. Does anyone here have any spiritual gifts? And do you know what they are? Raise your hand. I've never finished it. <clears throat> the place I've never finished it. If you want to finish it, I will print one off for you and we'll get together and give you Yeah, this printer, the words didn't come out clear with the list of it, so I couldn't read it. I'll print one out for you. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else know exactly what their specific gifts are? Wisdom. Wisdom. So means which one? Compassion. Bad compassion. Teaching. Teaching. Mine is preaching, teaching, and evangelism. Imagine that. Patience. Patience. I wish that was one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Sometimes I feel miserably at patience. So, if so, this is definitely a sermon for you, that you, if not, if you have any questions about it, please see me, and we can determine what your gifts are by that simple evaluation of the spiritual gifts inventory. They're very accurate. When you take them, you take them as, you know, as honestly as possible. Don't answer the questions as what you think you should answer them. Answer them truthfully. 
Because when you answer them truthfully, it tells you exactly what your spiritual gifts are. They're important. God has naturally gifted you to do certain things for him, not us. So when you do something for him, you essentially are doing his work for us. That's the difference. We can, when we do it for ourselves and do the things that we desire, we're doing things for ourselves, for you, for, you, for ourselves, not God, for you. It's a huge difference there. The gift of tongues is all about the spirit operating through us, through you. You have to allow it. He's not going to allow it and he's not going to force that. Just like the gift of tongues, if that's a gift of yours, the spirit operates through, through you. You have to allow it because that's not from you. The spirit will not force it upon you. Just like salvation, you have to be willing and want to do it. You have to be that willing vessel for Christ, for God the Father, for God the Holy Spirit. The word, if it says not everyone will have this gift, although some teach everyone has a gift and should develop it. Some people say that everybody should have the gift of tongues. Some people say that. Some people say that you have to develop that gift. Um, the verse 2 says, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, which means the word is in there, it says that not everybody will have that gift. You will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you, which means you're speaking a language that you don't know. It could be a heavenly language. It could be somebody speaking Korean in the back there. You could be speaking Korean to that guy. And I'm not particularly comfortable with that. You know, bust out in Japanese or something. Um, through the Spirit, that's just me. I'm glad I don't have that gift. I don't. Um, but if it was for somebody else, I'd be willing to do it. It'd be a little confusing to me, I think, but I, if, I, I studied Greek. I can only imagine studying Japanese or something like that. That'd be very confusing if you didn't know and you started speaking Japanese to somebody. Some people have that gift and enjoy it. It's probably awesome when it happens. But not everybody has that gift, just like me. Not everybody would be comfortable doing that. God knows you better than you know yourself. So you'd be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies it strengthens others, others, encourages them, and comforts them. That's why Paul says that the gift of prophecy is a greater gift, because when you speak in prophecy, it's not only just for the person you're speaking a prophetic word over, it's for the entire congregation because that prophetic word is over the entire congregation because that person's part of that congregation. When you speak in the tongues, you have to have an interpreter to do so. Because in the section here, it says a call to orderly worship a little later on in the message, it'll talk about what God expects. Gifts are an individual thing. It strengthens the believer, but when you use it in an orderly fashion, it strengthens everyone. Paul is clear that he thinks prophecy is a greater gift because it strengthens the whole church, not just the individual. So in verse 5 to 8, it says, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. So tongues can strengthen the whole church when he says that there's a person that has the gift of tongues, there's a person who has the gift of interpretation of those tongues. Unless I say, you know, if you have somebody in a foreign language, which I've seen that happen in a church service, someone speaks in that language, during that you don't need an interpreter because the person speaks that language. Sometimes it's a heavenly message and you need an interpreter that the Holy Spirit gives the interpretation to. So there's accountability on the person speaking in tongues and there's accountability to the person who is given the interpretation by God. So everybody's in an orderly fashion, on an orderly way, 
so everybody's not in the midst of chaos. So there's the reasons these things are in Scripture, so we need to heed the call to do things orderly and use our gifts. We first need to know what these gifts are and how these gifts need to be used. You see it says in verse 19, the gifts like tongues, there are proper venues for it and not proper for others. I've personally seen the gifts used and brought the Spirit of God in a very powerful way. I've also seen them used and they caused utter confusion where everybody's like, what? This happened. When there is confusion, there's not order. But when the Spirit of God is there, there is definitely order. It may be confusing to a person who has not experienced this before as to what is going on, but it will also bring people closer to God. Because when you see God show up and show off, then you can't help but be drawn closer to him. See, if you see somebody speaking in tongues, you've never seen that happen, then you see somebody over here interpret it. And you see them walk out of the congregation and they really don't know each other. Well, there's something unique happening. A particular state of an individual confusion is a lot different than a corporate state of confusion. Amen? Amen. How many have seen people that are confused individually about something that's going on, then it becomes clear? Like when you step out of a cab in Times Square in New York City, and you're like, whoa. But then you walk into a place where it's not managed correctly, and you got nobody's on the same page, everybody's reading the same book, uh, someone's on page one, someone's on page 15, someone's on page 50, and they're doing things in a completely different order, and you're just like, how in the world did you even get to the end of that? without walking out and saying, yeah, I'm done. Many powerful things happen when we let go and let God be God. When we let God be the God of our lives. When we let go, God leads us and we are leading others. And he's leading ourselves. We're not leading ourselves. We're allowing him to lead us. I would much rather have the creator and designer of our world and universe lead me to where he wants me to go than any other man be led by themselves. So if I call on a man, I get what a man can do. I get the order that that man can design. But if I allow God and I follow God, I get what God can do. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of talented people that I know and they can do great things for others. But none that I know can speak a world into existence by saying so. None have the power to tell a violent storm to stand down. None have the power to tell a giant fish to eat a runaway prophet and throw, and throw his butt up on the shores of where he's running from while creating a circumstance to get him in the water to start with like a violent storm, um, get them to the point where they're just in utter chaotic situation so they get to the point where they're going to draw a straw to find out whose fault it is. And Jonah, in the book of Jonah, and he was not surprised that it was his fault that he drew that short straw. He's like, yes, man, throw me overboard. Um, I know exactly where I'm going. And then just because he can save a literal boatload of people just because they have beer. People I know are talented, but no way near that talented. That orchestrated all that in a worldly setting where people don't like you, people reject you, people make fun of you, and make fun of your followers, but sends people because he cares about you so much that he's able to orchestrate something like a giant whale swallowing a human being and take him in the next direction where he's supposed to be going in the first place. And I think if Jonah, you're sitting in the belly of the whale, you just have to can you contemplate a few things. Like, it'd just been easier if I went to know. Okay. The good news is I know personally know the people who are 
and who can do that? There are God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are triune God. Our God loves orders, order, and loves giving us orders to do things, and he gives us gifts to use for his service. That's what they do. That's what we're for. So, where do we find this orderly script of what to do and how to do it? And if we keep reading down to verse 26, we find that answer. It's entitled, A Call to Orderly Worship, as I mentioned before. This states that God wants to use your gifts, want your gifts to be used in a certain way. There is all the gifts, not just some of them. So he wants all of the gifts that he gives us used in a certain way. Not just some of them, not just tongues, not just prophecy, not just preaching and teaching. He wants you to use them specifically in a specific way. If I can speak this morning. I'm getting tongue tied. There's a lot of specifics in this stuff. <laughs> some of you are called to do more than one thing. Some of you are called to do just one thing. Whatever God has naturally gifted you to do, use that gift for God's service. That's why he gave it to us. He didn't give it to us just to hoard it, hug on it, and uh, throw it away and say, that's just for me. That's for all of you. So the preaching, teaching, and evangelism is not just for me. It's for all of you. It's for God. Whatever you're called to do, we first got to find out what that is. And then you do what you're called to do in an orderly fashion by first letting your church leadership know what your gift is. That way, instruction on the use of the gift and a scriptural reference can be made. Notice I said a scriptural reference, not a man's reference. So if you come to me and say, I have a spiritual gift that I use, we're going to give you a spiritual gift inventory to confirm that. So once you confirm that gift, it's not up to me whether you use that gift. That's up to him, because he gave it to us. I didn't give it to us. It's up to me to recognize that. There's an orderly way in which to do that. So, as long as it's scriptural, manners required by scripture to concede to scripture. We are going all the way in here to verse 33 and 34, and this touches on a very controversial topic that one that needs a Jewish background in history to understand. So that verse runs all the way down to 33 and 34, and it describes a lot of things about two or three is supposed to speak in tongues, two or three interpreters, two or three to prophesy, two or three to preach, and two or three to teach, and that way everything runs in specific order. That's the way you see some people are called to leave a church, go to another, okay, and that's okay. When you do that, you can't just pour the people into your congregation, and other congregations can't just pour people into that, because you do damage to the body of Christ when you do that. That way, everybody, God calls you in a certain place, he calls you there, you probably got a reason to go there, and that reason is usually a spiritual gift that you have to be used for God somewhere else. So the controversial subject in verse 34, 33, if you'd like to understand that, um, it's one of the most misunderstood and misused scriptures in the Bible. If you'd like clarification on this scripture, please see me. And I will fill you in on the history and the context of why Paul states that. That is a unique situation to the church in Corinth. And we first must realize that this 1 Corinthians is a letter, one of the, the first letter that was written to the church in Corinth for a specific reason and for a specific problem within the church. So Paul is rebuking here in a specific, a specific issue in the church and in that church alone. So the bottom line is, if God, here is, if God gave it to you, it is not forbidden by Scripture. But everything that must be do must be done orderly, must be done in love, 
must be done in the proper way. And when it's done this way, we all know it's from God, by God, and through us. We are all unique, and we are all made differently. Using your gifts are not meant to change your person, but it's meant to change your heart, just like salvation is not meant to change your person, and then to change your heart. So, if you're called to preach and teach, it's not meant to change you and who you are. It's meant to change your heart and how you go about things. So, if you're a, a sociable guy and you're called to preach, you're still supposed to be a sociable guy that preaches. If you are a goof, which I am a lot of the times, um, and you're called to preach, you are still called to be the same person you are. I'm still a goofball. I just preach the word wrong. I like picking on people and having a good time. That's what you do. That's who I am. That's not going to change. What changed in my life is that I'm called to be a pastor, and if you would have looked at me 10 years ago, you'd still be laughing. You're like, that's weird. Sometimes it still feels a little weird. I don't think it's not. I don't think that's supposed to change. But what's supposed to change is God's supposed to be working through us how we are because he created me a certain way and that certain way is meant to reach other people. God created you a certain way and that certain way is meant to reach other people. We are all unique and we are all made differently. We are all different for a reason. Using your gifts are not meant to change your person but your heart. See, I'm still the same guy I was 20 years ago. My heart's changed. I'm the same guy. A lot more education. More knowledge. A whole lot more patience, although Amy may disagree with that one. I, <laughs> preaching I'm a pastor, that's the only thing that has changed. And, you know, your family is, when you preach, is subject to use in sermons at any time for any reason. Um, that's just the way it is when you're a pastor. I am unique and different from everyone else, but I'm still that same guy. Don't let anything change who you are, but allow God to draw you closer to him as you are. This is how it works. It works this way in an orderly fashion with the, with the gifts he has given you to use to accomplish his task through you. Be led... <coughs> not a leader because a true leader is led by God. Let me say that again. Be led, not a leader because a true leader is led by God. So if you want to be a leader, you first have to be led by God. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for Palm Sunday. Thank you for sending your son to die for us to save ourselves from ourselves. Um, thank you and for, for loving us that much that you knew that what we needed, you had a plan for us, you had an order in which the world was created, you knew what was coming, you put a plan in place for us. And next week we celebrate what your son did for us. We celebrate what you did for us. Because you essentially sent your son to die for those who rejected him. That is, relationship is open to us. We pray that, um, that you allow us to, and you humble us, ourselves to come to you and to find out what you have naturally gifted us to do. So we can use them in the order in which you want us to use them.